best action we can make. So that's a maximization. And then what we have to do is we have to consider, we have the sequence of our action, the environment, our action, the environment, our action, and so on and so on. So we have a maximization over our current action at time t. Then we have, we have to take the sum over all the different things the environment can do. These are our observations rewards. And we have to weight it according to the probability, this is the environment here, the probability that the environment actually does this particular thing. So that's the probability of the other player taking your queen when you do something silly. Or the probability of the, of the other player just ignoring that. So we have to weight all these possibilities. And so we go through this tree. Our action, we take the best action we can. We've got all the different possibilities that the agent will reply with at time t. Then we have our, our action at time t plus 1. Our next action. Then we have the environment. And so on and so on and so on. And we have to weight all these problem, all these according to how likely we think the environment is to do all these different things in response to our moves. And then we have here all the different rewards. So we're actually taking an expectation of all the rewards. This is a probability. This is what we take an expectation of. We have to have this whole tree of possibilities. Maximizing our actions, taking the expectation with respect to the distribution of the rewards, for the agent on the outside. So this is really just a formalization of this. And you can see the tree structure coming here. With the alternate our move, environment, our move, environment, our move, environment. And we're trying to come up with the maximum amount of rewards. And this is our model of how the opponent behaves. Okay? So it looks pretty scary. It's actually conceptually not that strange. Now there's a big, big problem with this. In general, if we want to be able to remember our definition of intelligence as the ability to perform well in a wide range of environments. Now this performs well, this performs optimally when we know what our environment is. Right? So that's not good enough. We don't in general know what our environment is. If we know what our environment is, we can brute force compute and come up with a solution. So that's one problem, that we don't know what our environment is. The other problem is that this is, of course, very, very difficult to compute. It's an exponentially large tree, and we take it all the way out to infinity. But we're ignoring computational costs. We'll get back to this later. We will get back to this. So theoretically, anyway, if we ignore the computational cost of this huge tree as we look through, ideally, all possibilities in the tree, um, we don't know what the environment is. But we have Solomonoff induction. This here is actually just a prediction of what the environment is going to do. Right? We have Solomonoff induction, which converges insanely well for anything. So what we can do is we can say, well, we don't know the true environment. How about we drop a Solomonoff predictor in there, right? So we replace the true environment with C. That was Marcus Hooter's idea. And this is what we get. So it's the same equation, but now we've got a C in here. So what it's doing is we don't know exactly what the environment is going to do, but we use Solomonoff induction to predict what it's going to do to all the different futures. Okay? And that is AIC. If you manage to bear with me, that's the basic model of uh, general superintelligence, ignoring computational costs. And you can prove um, that it converges to, uh, to optimal behavior in any environment where this is possible for a general agent. And there are some environments where it uh, is impossible. So, for example, let's say you have an environment, you have two doors, they're unmarked. You go through one door, you can never come back, or both doors, you can never come back to either of them. One takes you to heaven, one takes you to hell. What do you do? You have to go through one of them. No matter how smart you are, you can't solve this problem. You just have to guess. Right? So you can't actually have the optimal behavior in this environment unless you know in advance which door you have to take, because there's nothing you can do to find out about it. Right? So we have to have this sort of caveat here, where it's in any environment where this is possible for a general agent. And it turns out there are many environments where that is possible. So one of the things I did in my thesis was to try to spell out. Oh, there, there are other optimality results, by the way. There's greater optimality, or balance greater optimality. It's a whole bunch of different things. So one of the things I tried to do in my thesis is to spell out more exactly. <coughs> so that, yes? that, that's saying that it's not like a binary thing, like you, you live or you die. You can actually do repeatable measures on your environment so that you can have a learn. Is, is that that's not what you're saying, or is that what you're saying? If you have if you have one chance in one world and you have to go through the door, yeah. 
So, so you're just saying that it has to kind of be, you have to be able to do repeatable measures, so you can actually got a, le a, a, a learning path. Yeah, kind of. It, and it gets a little bit subtle. So it's basically, by repeatable, it's technically ergodic. Repeat, yeah, yeah. It's, it's an ergodic environment. And so if your environment is ergodic, it sort of basically means whatever mistakes you make, you can do something that sort of yeah. gets you back to before you made the mistakes. So that's, that's an important concept here. Yeah. Um, so, and you can see that this sort of, it looks like it, it basically satisfies our informal definition of intelligence. We want to be able to achieve a wide range of goals with a wide range of environments. And this converges to optimal in any place where it's possible for a general agent. So it satisfies our definition of intelligence, in theory. This is not computable. So, I wanted to sort of flesh this out a bit. Um, and I, I won't tell you details of how you did this, how I did this, um, but basically, I it's it's in the chapter. I formally define what all these different things are. We have Markov chains, ergodic MDP. So this is a, the ergodic thing you were um, sort of alluding to there. Um, we've got Markov chains, Bernoulli schemes, classification problems, bandit problems, blah 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 blah. Computable sequence prediction, function. There's a whole bunch of stuff, and this is this is a, um, a taxonomy. So as you go down, this becomes more and more specific. Some of the things up the top here are just too general. Um, but basically below some level here, everything in this space, it's possible, under the definitions I give, for a general agent to converge to optimal. And we know AIC converges in any of these situations. And these are whole classes of problems. These are not specific problems. These are entire domains of problems. So I would argue then, if you accept the definition of intelligence, the ability to perform well in a wide range of environments, AIC performs optimal in all these environments. It so it's satisfies that definition of intelligence. Okay. Now, the computability. This is the big uh, <laughs> big problem. It's not computable. And it's and it's bad for two reasons, essentially. One, this is just not computable at all. It's pretty bad. Um, <laughs> and the other thing is that this here is exponential. It's that whole tree I drew earlier on, right? It grows exponentially. So you've got two problems to deal with. One is you need to replace the Lomonoff induction with something that's actually a real predictor. Two, you've got an exponentially large search. Now, people um, try to solve these kinds of problems. People try to deal with these search spaces when they make chess playing programs and Go playing programs and all kinds of stuff like this, right? Um, they try to deal with this kind of problem. And people try to build predictors as well. So, what can we do? Well, there's a guy, Joel Vaness, and he has a background in making chess playing programs and Go playing programs. He's been quite successful at this. And he's uh, now being supervised by Marcus Winter, among others, in Australia. And he did the fairly obvious thing. He took the expected max tree, which is this <coughs> thing here, and he used Monte Carlo tree search, like they use in Go. And he took the Solomonoff predictor, and he replaced it with particular choice was context tree weighting and you have to throw in a complexity weighting as well for the complexity of the model because we want this Occam's razor to come in right and you can you can rewrite this equation in a slightly different way and then if you actually rewrite how what this is it almost looks identical it's so just Monte, basically Monte Carlo tree search means you don't do everything but you do a random selection of different yeah. outcomes and you th think that that's you hope that's going to be a sufficient yeah. estimate yeah. Yes, and you so you, you take all these samples through your tree and you then try to put confidence intervals at, at different points in the tree of how good or bad things are and you and you then adjust which parts you're going to look at intelligently and so on. And so there's a whole bunch of work has been going to there in chess playing program, the go playing program and so on to try to intelligently search through all these possibilities. And so you can we can use existing technology and we can come up with this Monte Carlo AIC. Uh, this is the reference here, the paper. Um, and you get something that actually does things. Um, so you can do simple prediction problems. Well, that's not really surprising. It's got a predictive built into it. Um, it can learn to play tic-tac-toe. Uh, it can learn to play paper, scissors, rock. It can learn to find its way through mazes where it can only see locally. So I can't see the whole maze. And it's in some corridor and it doesn't know. It has to actually walk down the corridor and mentally count how far it's gone in order to be able to know which decision to make at some point. It doesn't actually know its absolute location. How does yep. it know that it's making progress in maze solving? Um, 
Tabii, Cumhuriyet'in o 